In a mana in a rea rangatea ma tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Ko tina hel pennington toka ingoa. Hei kai fakahari matua ite te kahui faihanga. I am Tina Hale Pennington and I am from Takahui Whaihanga and we're proud partners with Engineering New Zealand and ACE New Zealand in the diversity agenda and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. We thank you all for joining us today and for the commitments many of you have made to making diversity and inclusion around Aotearoa. Special welcome to all of our diversity agenda members who are tuning in. And if you work for an architecture or engineering practice, then please take a moment to check out the website to see if your practice or firm is a member of the diversity agenda. If you're tuning in in your practice or company isn't a member of the diversity agenda, we would encourage you to become part of the diversity agenda. It's free and provides a range of resources and topics that are relevant to diversity and inclusion. The key focus for the diversity agenda is to improve Māori and Pacifica representation in architecture and engineering to help shape Aotearoa that reflects all of us. So this webinar today addresses the question and starts the kōrero around te tiriti o watangi and equity in architecture. We know that architecture as a profession is strongly Pākehā and male dominated, dominated, particularly in leadership positions. We also know that Takahui's Whaihanga's leadership, which is the board and its chairs, has spent time recently together discussing the importance of te kaunata aurata and the individual commitments needed individually and collectively by the profession. We're extremely lucky to have two outstanding wahini joining us today for this webinar, Nga Aho member Jay Kake and Nga Aho Kochu Chair Desna Whangashalam. Building on their recent column in Architecture Now's Aotearoa series, Desna and Jade will discuss the key issues, profession faces, cultural considerations and kaupapa Māori approaches to practice and the importance of te tiriti o waitangi within practices and projects. Hopefully there'll be time for questions today and I would encourage you if you do have a question, to please put it in the chat box panel. And if you have a particular question for Jade or Desna, please indicate that in the chat box. So welcome Jade and Desna. Ngā tāhi matawai te toku hapu, no mahi a hau, ko Taiporu tu te maunga, te awa, te moana, ko Taiporu tu toku kainga tūturu, ko Desna Whāna Shonam toku ingoa. As Tina so nicely introduced us, I'm the kai hautu for Ngā Aho, the National Network of Māori Designers. We spend pretty much everything across the built environment, so our dialogue today is going to be a little bit broader and more sort of grounded in the our Māori perspective of the world and how we use our design tools to um, achieve that kaupapa um, rather than sitting specifically within architecture. But um, no mai haere mai. Tēnā koutou, ko Jay Taki tōku ingoa, he iri tēnei mō Ngātohi, te arawa te pukitōhia. E tatu ake au e te rohe o te iwi Bangalang, Kei Pārua ahau e nuku ana, ko au he kai hautu o te kaupapa o Ngoto Kohi. So my name is Jay Kake and I've had kind of an interesting life journey, but I was raised in Australia and my dad's Dutch, but now I'm living in my ancestral kohe here in Whangarei amongst my people of Ngātuhau and Tarapau, Ngātikahu, Torangare. And I run a small kaupapa Māori practice called Matakohi. And um, I, I just was reflecting when uh, Tina was introducing us that um, actually we're not a member, maybe we should join up to the diversity agenda. Um, but we're five wahine Māori actually. Um, so maybe that, that'll help us uh, expand our horizons. We might get some time next thing. Kia ora. Um, so as I introduced um, earlier, uh, Ngā Aho, which is our rōpū that connects um, all of our practitioners across Aotearoa and now um, recently more into the international indigenous framework, um, has been grounded in, um, in Te Ao Māori primarily. We were approached um, many years ago to look at, at an urban planning agenda and from that corridor came about this network of, of diverse design practitioners that work in relationship to the environment. So um, the concept of diversity for us, both in terms of cultural representation and diversity of thoughts, obviously, you know, it's a really um, visible dialogue at the moment across governance and industry and policy. Um, within Aotearoa, our key PO that we approach this from is from a treaty platform primarily 
Um, that's both as our guiding platform of sovereign knowledge systems and also it talks to the fact that we work in partnership in practice Ngā Ahua, uh, we apply design skills to achieve Māori aspirations and envisaging designing and realising future Aotearoa. So Ngā Ahua translates to the many strands, it communicates the concept of bringing together the many different strands of the Māori design world to explore and articulate our Māori culture through strategy, planning, architecture, landscape architecture, visual communications, design thinking and design education. Um, and on our personal note, I just really wanted to um, underscore the importance of Ngāho and, and what it's meant to me as a, uh, you know, young-ish, <laughs> getting older, but, you know, certainly as a, as a, when I was a student and when I was just emerging in the profession, uh, it was actually through connecting with Ngāho and meeting Māori practitioners who uh, thought the way that I did and had the same uh, view around the purpose of our profession, the purpose of their work that we do is what kept me in the profession, profession because I quit, I quit architecture twice. I really couldn't see a place for myself in it. And I really did, and I didn't have any connections. So it was quite hard to see how I would break into that industry um, and graduating during the global financial crisis didn't help. Um, but connecting with Ngā in 2012, um, when I was just thinking to return it and try to do my masters uh, for the second time, uh, really, it was, it was quite life-changing for me and it set me off on a really um, incredible path. And I, I just really wanted to tell that little personal story because I think as we'll see today, we are constantly losing Māori students and practitioners from our profession. It's really hard to hold on to them for a variety of reasons. And for me, that hole was really key for me staying in there, sticking in there and then now being in the position where I am now. I think our co-papa overall is um, is somewhat uh, outward facing in terms of like talking to the co-papa of being able to better see our faces and our places. Um, and um, for I guess at the time that we started out, it was pretty obvious that we couldn't see ourselves within our landscapes. The way that the landscape has been designed within Aotearoa could have been anywhere. Um, it didn't speak to our co-papa. It didn't speak to our people, and it, and it didn't speak to our connections to place. And um, as Jake um, talked about, when you were, when I felt this too, when I was going sort of through tertiary education, the um, the meaning behind the design, um, the way that we were taught to design, wasn't well grounded in the co-papa of here. As tangata whenua, all of our mahi that we do is always in relationship to place and it's in relationship to spirit and, and energy. And so, um, yeah, having the um, Ngā Aho kaupapa grow over the years, we've really done, we've done a lot to nurture our own practitioners too. So um, thinking about our value chain and how we can um, measure the well-being of our peoples and connection with the environment and the connective practice in between. Um, so we put forward the proposition that the, um, indigenous, bringing Indigenous to the fore and designing concepts and products or frameworks or um, ways of doing, ways of being have long-term meaningful outcomes and impacts for our communities. To be able to see our design tools within in that kind of, um, within that framing, just gives it a lot more meaning in terms of we're creating long-term change and that's connected to well-being for place, it's connected to well-being of people, um, and it gives us more than a commercial driver. Right, so as I alluded to and as Tina mentioned, um, you'll see that the profession really is overwhelmingly Pākehā and the gender breakdown isn't on this uh, chart, there's another one for that somewhere, um, but I'm sure it's uh, similarly weighted um, towards men. And we see that changing in architecture school, um, at least in terms of gender, I think it's close to achieving parity or perhaps has already achieved it. And we're not necessarily seeing that retention uh, when we move into practice. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to uh, representation of Māori, Pitika, uh, and other um, ethnicities that are not New Zealand Pākehā, um, again, we're just not seeing the numbers represented in profession, and we're having similar issues with uh, retention both of students and then once they leave. Uh, and I was shocked when I saw this. So for a long time, I thought, oh, I'll never get registered, oh, and I'm still not. But um, I'm working towards it now. And, you know, I just thought that that wasn't something that was on the cards for me. But when I realized that our numbers are just so very low, and yes, I feel like I'm able to make an influence on the profession, semi outside of it, in, in it, but slightly outside the club because I'm not registered. But um, the more I've become involved with the Institute and the more I've understood about the NZRIB um, and, you know, it's 
it, it really pressed home for me the importance of getting Māori registered as architects. And I had a conversation with a mentor of mine recently. And she said, what will it change? It won't change the work that you're able to do. Um, you, know, you, know, to, you know, what do you think this will change for you? And she is a registered architect and she's involved with the NZRD. And I said, actually, the big one for me is to be able to bring others through. And I do think if we're going to um, have an impact on our profession, I think it's important that we really represent it here. Um, so, but I think something that's um, also important is that a lot of our leading Māori designers, those that have a, a profile that um, are doing really amazing work and not registered up yet. And I think the profession, both the NZAA and the NZIB have been asking themselves seriously and entering into dialogue to understand well, why, why is that? So I would really hope to see those numbers increase because we do have more Māori practitioners than we have represented amongst the list of those who are registered as architects. And this uh, came from a research report, which was actually, it was um, Elizabeth Hesa who mentioned it to me. And then when I looked it up and uh, I, I was shocked to see that it, it's true that our numbers of Māori students who are graduating into the profession are declining, which should be of huge concern particularly because in recent years, we've seen validity given to Marco Ranga Māori, we've seen statutory provisions, as well as non-statutory guidance that is um, encouraging the use of Māori design principles, engagement with mana whenua, expressing these through projects. And yet our numbers of students who are actually getting through their studies and entering into the profession is declining. And that's not even addressing the issue of keeping them in the profession once, once they've entered it. And so that should be a huge concern to everybody. Um, I'm not saying that no Māori cannot do some of these things that are required, can't work for mana whenua, et cetera, but um, I really work on the ethos that we should be building, you know, building up our own people and we should be having, you know, encouraging hapuranga tiritanga on projects. And so those with the closer whakapapa should be engaged. And so we're having to use outside people because we can't, get the numbers and we can't keep them and that's a huge problem. And so this is uh, just some of those uh, statutory and non-statutory provisions I alluded to. Now the reason I wanted to bring this up and this slide is from the Auckland plan but it's relevant in and two, two jurisdictions in particular. So in Auckland we um, had the local government Auckland Council Act of 2009 and through that we had the Independent Māori Statutory Board established which it gives it a budget and statutory function. And why that was so important is because you finally had a tool to really hold council to account and have the recommendations have to be taken on board. And so a lot of the really positive things we're seeing in Tamaki are um, as a result of two things. One, pre settlement. So we're seeing more and more iwi settle. And that's not to say that because they've suddenly got all this money, that the money return is quite small, but it means that they're able to have professional staff and dedicated people working on these things um, and to be able to maintain some critical mass and some momentum it's really hard if you're pre-settlement and you're kind of here you know doing little contracts here and there and then they have to go get a real job and then now they're doing this on the side and they're working 60 hours a week and you know it's it's really rough actually and so it's something that treaty settlement does is enables uh, you know people to be working on these things full time and not have to do their other jobs and be able to maintain some continuity and maintain good records and systems and that kind of thing. And then the other part is around establishing the Independent Māori Statutory Board because the Statutory Board has been able to um, really push Auckland Council hard to really, um, you know, take on board, um, you know, mana whenua perspectives and have to kind of fulfil certain obligations. Um, and it's really strengthened the, the treaty relationship, um, which is often quite um, weak at a local government level because the way our levels of government are structured, technically local councils don't have to consider themselves a treaty partner. So when we're going through treaty um, hearings, for example, it's not possible to call up local government for cross-examination because they can say, well, we're not the treaty partner. And there might be a few provisions in the Local Electoral Act and Local Government Act um, that help to a degree. Um, but it is really weak. And so it's much stronger in Auckland Council because we have the likes of the Independent Māori Statutory Board. And they were very involved in the early work to get Tiaraga principles um, integrated into Auckland Council policy and process. So it was with the support of the Independent Māori Statutory Board that um, Ngā Apo were able to 
start to um, develop their advocacy, our advocacy approach to Auckland Council. And from there, we were able to develop a business case uh, after many, many meetings with what was whatever it was before it was the ADO, which is gone now. Council's really hard to keep up with. But anyway, a group of people within council. Um, and so from that advocacy, we were able to see a few things happen. So one was the establishment of Phil Wehongi and Kamari design lead role and later team. So there's uh, Phil and Olivia, and I think they've got a few others, but those were the, uh, the two that are leading it um, within Auckland Council. It also saw um, the appointment of Ngāahō members to Auckland Urban Design Panel, and um, I'm, I'm one that's just a new appointee, so that'll be an interesting experience and really um, great to see um, how that has progressed since we were doing this early advocacy work. It involved the Te Aranga principles and other case studies on the website. And I did see that there's just been recently a bit of a, not a relaunch, but a, a launch of a new suite of tools. So do check that out. That's really positive. And I believe the other one was around internships. So there was a number of Māori uh, internships that, that were set up across the council with a design focus. Um, and then there was also um, requiring Te Aranga, uh, design principles on Auckland Council's own projects. Um, as well as encouraging private sector adoption through the you know, design guidance in the Auckland Design Manual, as well as through the Auckland Design Panel Assessment process. Before we go on to this, and I'll hand it back to um, Des, is that uh, on the statutory provisions, I just wanted to also mention um, Autotahi because there were some specific provisions in the earthquake recovery legislation that meant that Ngai Tuahuriri, um, the mana whenua hapu, around the Ōtautahi area became a partner in the rebuild and so it meant that they had to be involved on projects and so through Matapōpori Trust which is the mandated depot they have their own designers and they've done really phenomenal things like develop the bible of narratives that are approved and they have their approved kaimahi uh, planners, designers, artists that they're able to deploy on projects in a really organized way. And we're seeing the fruits of that now. And you can see some really high profile, fantastic examples if you walk around the streets of Ōtautahi. So these statutory provisions matter. And I guess um, it helps sometimes to understand if you look around the city and it's starting to look, look Māori, it's starting to feel like us, why is that? And often it's a combination of the work of practitioners as well as law changes. Um, you know, that have enabled that to occur. So I did just want to point to those two and I'll hand it back to you. I think for us, I mean, we've been around for maybe about 12 years and a lot of us were, I mean, we were obviously, we were already operating in these spaces and so um, being young Aho practitioners and um, yeah, the Aho has provided us with um, a cohesiveness to be able to connect across different generations and connect our, um, tertiary rangatahi that are coming through with the Māori design practitioners that are, that are actually out in the field um, doing the mahi but then also making sure that all of those practitioners and the, and the um, tertiary, tertiary education providers are connecting with the iwi and hapu and whānau and, and within their own landscape so that um, that network that we have created through Ngā Aho has been something quite fundamental in terms of our being able to um, change the way that design is approaching the landscape and, and give voice to um, to Tangata Whenua within, um, mainly within our urban settings. Um, the It's interesting when you kind of think about the concept of Tangata Whenua in terms of that we are people of the land. Um, so when we're trying to navigate these kind of spaces, we're always thinking about have we got, um, have we, uh, got the environment best interest at heart and have we got um, spirit of place um, connected to the way that we go about doing things and also are we nurturing really healthy relationships with each other so I guess you know within an Aho context I'm always thinking about when we're weaving together our kōrero for um, hui or, or wānanga or um, indeed you know working with our partners out within the design industries is that whakawhanaungatanga element so um, the relationships between um, Tangata Whenua and Tangata Tiriti is just as an important as our, um, outcome for us as the things that we're creating within those discussions. So um, that's kind of where the energy comes into it in a way. And the wider, um, obviously also we're always navigating in, um, 
in relationship to our ancestors uh, before us and our tipuna, so more recent tipuna, have we carried through on the things that they, they were intending of we sort of taking their voices into account and are we thinking about what the next generations are, um, are wanting to achieve and how we're going to bring them into those spaces. Yeah, I think this is um, this is really important, and a lot of uh, this distinction, Tangata Whenua, Tangata Kiriti, comes from um, mostly Pākehā treaty educators who worked in collaboration with Tangata Whenua, um, you know, particularly in the early 90s, a lot of Pākehā women who really did a lot of the groundwork to understand who they were as Pākehā and how that relates to the treaty. And it set a really good blueprint that enables all of us to understand our place. And your positionality is really important because it determines you know, what spaces you have the right to and what are the ethical implications of different kind of work that you may do. And so to use an example that's relevant to uh, architecture is that you know, we will often see uh, Pākehā architects, usually men, and um, they might work on a project that is uh, with E as a client, and they might do a beautiful building that uh, might win a lot of awards. And my question always in that situation is it's not to undermine uh, the manafino who might be the client because they have the right to work with whoever they choose. But my question to that practitioner is what are you doing to give back to that manafino group and to nurture their practitioners? So that you're obsolete and I think about that in my own work so if I'm invited to go to work somewhere where I don't fuck up one of the things I'll do is I'll ask them did you know it well first I'll figure out who, who, who out of our practitioners fuck up with you and I would say well did you know that you've got three architects who come from your iwi would you like their contact details um, you know perhaps they would be a better fit for the project and if they say, oh, no, we really want to work with you because you have specific skills, because you did this project and um, you've got expertise in this area, and this is a, something that's happened to me before, then I'll say, okay, well, how can I, I'll, I'll, would you like to engage consultants, other consultants, engineers, surveyors, you know, county surveyors, et cetera, who fuck up to your iwi? And usually they say, yeah, you know, we're really wanting to create opportunities for our people and use our own people where we can. And so then I'll try to get on board consultants who have pop up to that area as well as the right skills. And if there are students or young people or young practitioners who are coming through, then I'll try to support them to work on their own projects. So for instance, um, we had an intern last summer and she's coming back to us for another summer. And her, once she reconnected with her in the ride, they became reacquainted with her, hadn't seen her for a little while. She's been living in Tamaki. Um, they said, oh, we want to do a new ablution block. Can you design it? And she you know, still a student, not able to take the project on herself. And so I said, that's fine because we can umbrella it and I'll support you to be able to do the work. And that's the exact same scenario that I had in the past, you know, when I worked closely with Roy Hoskins and it really enabled me to gain a lot of confidence and to be able to quite early on lead projects with my own, own whanau. And so that's a kind of a long-winded example, but getting down to the nitty gritty, your positionality matters and it doesn't matter if you're Māori or Pākehā I don't think that we necessarily there are ethics involved in all of our choices including the clients the projects that we take on and I'm encouraging everybody to think about that in their own practice because I think about it in mine I don't think just because I'm Māori and I work in architecture that I ought to do every Māori project um, you know there, there's there's specific truth to that and so if we could go back a slide <laughs> um, Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, so this was just related to my earlier um, portal to say that, you know, this two house model is quite helpful because it means that, um, you know, under Te Atuti or Waitangi, there is a role for everybody and there's a place for everybody. Because I think sometimes people feel threatened by this idea because they don't, they don't understand where they fit. And they go, well, what about me? I didn't choose to be born here or I didn't choose this and that. And does that mean I'm excluded? Does that mean there's no place for me? Um, and this is, I guess, a way to reassure people that no, under Te Atuti or Waitangi, if it, it is um, honoured and, and, and observed in the way it was intended, there is a place for everybody. And I hope that we can start to think of our profession in this way, 
So at the moment, it's really skewed on one side in architecture. And so we've got, you know, majority party health practitioners, majority party health practices, um, not many practices that have a, a, at a, a senior principal level or, or as directors, um, non Pākehā people, let alone Māori, and we have a very small number of Pākehā Māori students. Um, but I've also been really fortunate to work with some mainstream practices on some really um, fantastic projects in a collaborative manner, where I've been there as a designer, um, you know, who's been appointed by my hapū, and able to work collaboratively with these, uh, you know, very experienced, very skilled uh, mainstream architects to get a really fantastic design outcome. And again, the relationships, the power balance isn't equal, but when we've had really, um, you know, architects who want to do this well and are really committed to the process, then it's, it's, it's been a really good process and we've gotten a really good outcome. And so maybe that is a future for our profession where we start to see this partnership, but on more of an even footing and we understand our place, whether it's from the Tritsi or from the funeral. Um, and I, I threw this slide in because related to that previous quarter, and this is a, the amazing group, Asian Supporting Funeral Language um, And it's, this is not in an architectural context, but I guess it's to say that uh, honoring Te Atiriti and supporting Dragon Te Ratanga doesn't have to be restricted to Pākehā. And so the way this treaty is structured, it does support both those who were the original signatories to the agreement and their descendants, but everybody who has come since then. Um, and so, yeah, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you're not Māori or Pākehā, that does, this, this all still applies to you, there is a place for you, um, and um, just really encourage you to think about your positionality and, and the two-house model and, and, and what that means for how you practice and how you approach, um, you know, projects working with one of Whenua, how you approach working in practice. Oh uh, yeah, so I threw this one in because this Black, the Black Lives Matter movement and the way it um, was expressed here in Aotearoa was really interesting. And I think for a lot of people, it was a bit of a light bulb kind of wake up moment. Um, and in some ways I feel, you know, maybe, all of the things that we've seen around Te uh, Atiriti or Waitangi and our own political movement could have been the wake up. Um, I think a lot of people really um, started to think about things a bit differently uh, after seeing what was happening with the Black Lives Matter movement. And then conversely started to look internally and think, well, what am I doing in my work and my everyday action? And so, I think um, without spending too much time thinking about this because it's we're talking about this because it's a complex issue and it's um, not it's a little bit to the side of what we're hoping to talk about today. Just that people have many entry points to to this quite proper and thinking about diversity, thinking about treaty relationships. Um, and I think it's important to meet people where they are. So, you know, entry point was quite quite um, I also thought it was interesting that um, a lot of people here were very committed to contextualizing the Black Lives Matter movement appropriately. And so linking it to our own struggles as Māori and as people across the Pacific. Um, and so I think it's that, that transnational solidarity that's really important and that local contextual analysis that's really important. And so to bring it back to architecture, we can see that there's um, a lot of moves afoot in places like the United States, places like the UK, um, seeking to um, see uh, more black architects in practice, seeking to see more uh, other indigenous architects in practice. And I guess that relationship with Tangata Whenua is, is a bit different to the relationships of, of other marginalized peoples, but that's not to say that those struggles are irrelevant. And so it can be a bit of a tricky space to kind of navigate. Um, here, I think we're fortunate because we do have Te Atiriti or Waitangi that we can see that as kind of a korowai over everybody. And that's our tool to be able to address the inequities that exist. One of the really important relationships that we've had is, um, is uh, thanks to the NZIA for um, 
actually taking their commitment, they're, they're taking the step in their commitment to walk in partnership with, with Ngāaho. We, we also have um, partnerships with other New Zealand design institutes, such as um, the Institute of Landscape Architects. Um, and we've worked in partnership with planners and um, yeah, various other design institutes. Um, there's different ways of tackling this sort of, this sort of thing. So with um, the New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects, for instance, we had an MOU, um, which was still relatively approached in um, a treaty kind of manner in terms of the, the looking at the partnership and how we might reference each other. Um, reference each other's mahi and um, whakamana, so give um, presence and respect to those different ways of doing things. Um, the uh, Te Kauai Ngato Rata, um, the covenant that, that formalises the relationship between Ngā Aho and um, NZIA um, was a major change in our landscape. Um, having Hari Williams largely um, at the helm of that sort of gives it embedded knowledge of place in a way that, that really does create some fundamental change. Um, if you haven't had the privilege of um, having a corridor with Haria or spending some time with him, he's got this phenomenal background where he uh, grew up on the Wahiwa Harbour and he didn't speak um, Te Reo Pākehā until he was eight. Um, he grew up with his grandparents. He stepped in that kind of knowledge of place um, in a way that a lot of us just don't have the opportunity to be anymore um, because we had lived in these highly urbanised and uh, built up landscapes. And Hardy's knowledge too of the way to navigate those different knowledge systems is again, it's unique. Um, he's an orator and an artist in both worlds in the way that he communicates. And that I think gives us a, a depth of um, understanding of creative understanding to draw from about how we weave together these spaces um, of discussion because in essence, Anything that we're doing is always going to be negotiation. It's um, getting to a point where um, whoever it is, that whichever partners you're working with, that you're both able to uh, bring to fruition the things that really matter to you. And I think that's also a way of considering um, how to te ao pākeo or how to um, tell where we sit within a, a, a treaty landscape is that we do have shared kaupapa. We have things that we would all like to see. We'd all like to see, I think, people being um, healthier. We'd all like to see the environment being healthier. We'd all we'd like to uh, see our live spaces that we occupy being healthier. So through those shared kaupapa, I think, you know, there's always the potential for for stronger um, connections and with the with the treaty uh, providing our framework of how we go about approaching this place you, you really do dig into things like having respect so um, respect for each other and respect for each other and all of our interactions also respecting those you know um, such as Hardy that have that authority and responsibility to place and that connection to place so that tanga that they bring to the way that they um, approach any of these discussions um, the tikanga, so protocols around how we go about um, interacting with each other and how we go about interacting with place and how we uh, form what it is that, uh, that we consider important to ourselves. And um, mahi ko tahitanga, so how do we actually work to, um, alongside each other and with each other effectively. And of course, um, when you're talking about the diversity side of things, there's a just representation comes into it. Um, make sure that you're turning up, up um, our kānoho here and also that you are uh, giving voice to the people that are of those particular places. So drawing, I think the two strengths, if you look at, if you were to put it in a very simple way of a, like a Western knowledge system and a te ao, um, Māori knowledge system is uh, that the Western system built around tertiary ed um, education institutes is largely on the basis of comparing everybody's knowledges and sort of um, choosing selecting bits and pieces and kind of competing these things against each other and from that we, we move forward in a way you know that is um, more well informed and um, you know a science way I guess of approaching knowledge and if you look at Mataranga Māori because that's which includes the real our language that's connected specifically to place and to long-term occupation of a place so that knowledge uh, which is embedded in our landscape um, yeah, it brings a slightly different perspective in terms of time. It brings a different perspective in terms of where the land sits in this. And there's a, you know, I spoke to earlier, it brings a different perspective in terms of the energy because Mataranga is also based around how do we weave everybody together as opposed to how do we find all the different components. So 
Um, it's interesting to, to go back and forth between these two knowledge systems and really think about how it is that we can um, connect with each other and use our tools to create change. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about some of our wānanga tō or huia tō, which we have at um, Marae each year for three to four days, where we have uh, practitioners, uh, design practitioners, rangatahi, that are coming through the tertiary institutes, and we have senior kāhui and kaumātua from Ngā Aho, um, who have been in those, obviously, in the industries for a lot longer or have different knowledge sets that they bring from place. And we also try to work with um, communities as well, so hokainga, the home people that occupy those places, and weave together events that draws on all of those different knowledge systems and those different um, experiences of our world. Um, that keeps that keeps up our design mahi very grounded um, and uh, relocates what your priorities are in terms of like if you're going to actually walk your talk in creating healthy well-being. It's sort of to go to somebody's marae and um, hear their stories and what their needs are. Uh, and really think about how do we um, how do we take the tools that we've had the privilege to learn through tertiary because not everybody can access tertiary. Um, how do we take those tools and weave them together and create some difference for our people that are on the ground? So we you know we try to think about like what the current states are, what the future states are, and what the different scenarios are, and weigh up the different options and um, prototypes, sort of build different ways of um, testing out those ideas while we're on the ground and also in, offer those knowledges and those knowings and any of the products that uh, come up from those workshops back to the home people. Um, it's interdisciplinary, it's intergenerational, it's a diverse community collaboration because of the hokaim or the different marae that we go to have all got quite different landscapes that they're interacting with. Um, and I think too they've been, um, they've been really good nurturing spaces for tangata whenua. Um, there's a, sometimes it can be, a, um, it can be extremely challenging, you know, but almost a certain kind of a violence in the way that um, if you're a tangata whenua and you've come from those backgrounds and then you go out into the professions, the way that people accept or don't accept the way that we see the world or what our priorities are. And um, to have safe spaces where we can discuss what those challenges are and get some inputs and get some perspectives and kind of recharge ourselves before we go back out into the community has been um, an extremely important thing for all of us to be able to continue on the pathways that we, um, yeah, pathways from leaving home to going to tertiary to going out into the professions. So they're kind of, they've, they've been little points of light for us really. Would you like to talk about our international flying chain? Yeah, sure. Um, so since uh, I believe it was 2016, um, Ngāho have been hosting international um, hoi. So really how that came about is a few of our members were um, get setting quite a bit and had uh, been rubbing shoulders with some of our international architect and designer, Sanona, and thought, well, it might be time for us to host them. And so I'm talking about where my entry point was. I know others have had longer relationships, um, but 2016 was a big year where we had our first um, international hui, uh, Ife Tumatanga, and that was at Whakapara here in uh, just north of Whangarei. And so, um, you know, we had Manuhiri come from Canada, US, um, parts of South America, Australia, um, a few other places. And so it was a really good, good mix. And these have been really enduring relationships. And so uh, in 2018, we had our, our next three that was in Autotaki. And we learned some new things again, some familiar faces and a few new ones. Um, but we've also been heading overseas as a, as a raw crew. And I, I've, I've, I've been there for a lot of them, maybe not everything, but there's been a few different hui um, in Sydney, Melbourne, uh, we had an amazing trip in 2017 where we went to Canada and the US and we, uh, a group of us uh, went to the Royal Architects Institute of Canada um, Symposium in Ottawa. But we also went on a, a study tour uh, through uh, Vancouver, Seattle, Vancouver, Ottawa, uh, New Mexico through to Albuquerque. And um, people jumped on and off at different points in the journey, but uh, we covered a lot of ground and we were able to visit some of the buildings and spaces that um, were designed by or were important to our um, those who are hosting us, who had been uh, forming these relationships. 
And something that surprised us, I think, is that, um, well, surprised me, is just how much we had in common, even though our cultures are quite different. Although in some places, the cultures were kind of similar. There's some aspects of Coastal Salish culture I find a bit similar, maybe because of the relationship with the Moana. Um, and so this is, uh, where are we? We're, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the First Nation, but we're in this, it's like a, it's like a it's just like a house that's used for ceremonial purposes. So it had a, it felt a bit like a marae, but the, the way it's used is a bit different. And Desna might remember the details, but it felt, um, it was a real privilege to be here. Um, we were there because there was a new building going up on, on the reservation, but um, we were also privileged to visit um, the spaces that are important to them and used by them now. It's been, uh, I think it's the Puyala um, territory possibly, that one. But it's been interesting too to um, connect to um, our international... Yeah, it's been interesting to orient ourselves within that sort of a wider Indigenous landscape and be able to share those stories of place um, and have a look at the different ways that people are bringing through their, their design to their communities. They've got, um, you know, obviously they've got a different... Um, framework, uh, legislative framework that they're working within, um, but our whanaunga, um, Daniel, who's on the left-hand side in that photo, that had come to both Iti Matanga and uh, Nga Te Kore, um, took us through a lot of the different places that were close to his people and sort of talked through some of his projects, and but then also talked about what the artisans are doing within their different territories and there are things like yeah there's the, you know the ceremonial houses such as the one that we're standing in here where they have their hui and their wānanga um, and the mahi that, mahi toy that you see on the walls there talks to their spirit of place and their ancestors um, in this case it had a really humble little uh, cookhouse out the back that would look that looks like something like a New Zealand railway cottage basically it's tiny um, but they managed to feed as we do hundreds um, or thousands of people through these spaces. Um, then a lot of similarities in terms of manakitanga, so the um, care and warmth and um, intent presence that we experienced in each of these places was extremely humbling. Um, and it also, I think, you know, looking at the profession side of things, it opened us up when we were going to more of the, the conference side of things, that how many people, how many other Indigenous peoples are looking to things like the Te Aranga principles that is um, a way that they might be able to tackle their relationships with local authorities and try and see themselves within their urban centres too. Uh, much like us, there's that they can be massive homeless populations that are frequently have got Indigenous roots but are no longer able to occupy the urban landscape as Indigenous. They, you know, they're facing social and cultural and um, educational inequalities. Um, and then, you know, some of their iwi have managed to um, get that kind of capital basis to be able to try and move some of these things. But it's interesting to be able to share our stories and do that in a way that is connected to place um, because it gives us the opportunity to, to you know, talk about things like here's what worked for us and here's what really didn't work and these were some of the barriers that were along the way um, and these are some of the high points that actually really made a significant amount of change for us. So um, yeah, that, that opening up those connections and those landscapes and being able to do that in a real world way in terms of visiting um, their territories has been quite profound for us. And unfortunately, obviously, with the COVID context this year, um, that put the kibosh on at our next um, gathering, which we were going to do with the Canadian Indigenous Task Force. But uh, hopefully things will get healthier again within the next couple of years and we will be able to, you know, to continue growing that dialogue. Is, that pause makes it sound like it's me. Okay, is this our wrap up slide? I feel like it might be. <laughs> um, so these are really our, our, our I guess our, our take home messages um, is that, you know, we really do need to bolster the numbers in our profession, both, you know, recruiting and retention, because it's, it's, it's quite a long journey um, through architecture. And then it's quite, um, it's still quite difficult, even when people have invested all of this time and energy and you've gotten them through uni, it's quite difficult keeping them. So we really need, we need more Māori, we need more Pacifica, but we also need um, more from other, other cultures because again, it's a problem for everybody if the profession is overwhelmingly um, Pākehā and overwhelmingly men. 
because it means that only uh, you know a one one segment of the population is represented and i know i think as um you know, as working in the architectural profession we like to think that you know we you know we're really good at engaging radical empathy and we can you know get into the minds of others and you know try to design spaces that meet those needs and i think that's true but there's limits to that um and i think that unchallenged we end up with particularly civic spaces but also commercial also residential um that do not meet the needs of, of those that are using and living and, and, and occupying these spaces. And so I think that is the importance of, of diversity in our profession. Um, and I don't know what the last thing were on there, so I'll just give you to the back. Okay, um, yeah, and so, and then also, you know, being at the right level, so, um, you know, we might get Māori practitioners, but then when we often hear this, you know, the junior practitioners that we put up for, up front for a project, but actually they don't have the experience and they're not actually given the responsibility to lead, um, but they're kind of sometimes traded on for their uh, cultural utility, which is a big problem. Um, and so not pushing people into those roles before they're ready, but actually genuinely being committed to advancing them so that we do have Māori, Tupika, um, and other, you know, other minority practitioners who are actually at the highest levels of practice. And I think part of the things that could help that is actually more support for um, people to establish firms themselves. Um, so both progressing through mainstream or established practices, as well as um, more support to be able to get these practices off the ground. And procurement initiatives uh, are really helping in that regard, I believe. Um, and yeah, and so that procurement aspect is really important. So there's a, a, a co-op called Amotai that's uh, working a lot with construction projects and construction firms, but they're really seeking to increase um, the share of Māori and Pacifica businesses that are, are getting these contracts, particularly with local and central government. And then um, I saw when in the lead up to the election that there was, um, you know, there was a, a, a big commitment put out publicly by political parties to be able to see procurement increase for uh, Māori and um, you know, physical businesses, and I believe Labour was addressing that policy as well. So I'd hope to see that continue to grow. So one of the, our um, guiding whakatauki um, that we consider when we're sort of looking at the Tiara and cultural landscape strategy, which um, prefaced the um, Tiara no uh, Māori design principles, was what are the benefits of, um, it made us think about what are the benefits of being able to share our different knowledge systems and why are we doing what we're doing? And um, yeah, I think, you know, I was speaking to earlier about our connection that we have across different kaupapa that like regardless of what um, cultural background that you come from and um, what your education pathways are and what your tools are that you use to do this, that the more that we share our ideas and the more that we share our wisdoms, the better it is for every, for, for all of us, for, um, for our environment, for ourselves, for our rangatahi, for our kaumatua, for um, for our professions and the way that we go about out, about weaving these spaces, um, I think to you know the, the willingness to be open to actually really listen to people and to uh, attempt to have more empathy for the different ways that people go about uh, participating in the conversation is really important. Um, it's really important to give space to those that. Um, May not usually have space in these in, in these forums. So I guess whenever we go into a conference or whenever I go into a conference or a hui or a panel discussion, I'm always kind of thinking about who isn't there and who could we be making space for and what what voices are not being heard in this landscape. So um, whether yeah, again whether that's rangatahi or elders or whether that's people that are coming from different cultural backgrounds, how do we create space for them? And how do we share our knowledge in a way that everybody can connect with them as opposed to sort of seeing them as tools for competition or to, um, you know, to have be uh, higher up the food chain as it were with other people when it comes to commercial projects. I think honestly, we could pretty much, you know, across um, Te Ao Māori, across Aotearoa, share everything that we are doing in an extremely open manner and build on everybody's knowledges and we've still got a hell of a long way to be able to we still have a long way to go to create social and cultural equity at the moment. Some of that, you know, the statistics which everybody are appalled is 
appalled by that have come up in the Black Lives Matter are also a lived reality for Te Ao Māori um, within our landscape. So the more that we share and the more that we listen, the more that we care. I think that you know the better the products that we can design and come out from come out um, that will come out from our work. So um, yeah, kia ora and thank you for listening to us today. Uh, we yeah, really appreciate to, uh, the opportunity to be able to share a little bit of our pathway and how we came about doing the things that we do and why we do them. Um, and we're always open for further corridor as well. And we can do we. Kia Thank you, Jade and Disna for your mahi. We have uh, several patai uh, on screen, so I will try and work through as many as I can. Uh, Wonderful to hear about the work that Na'aho is doing. Thank you for sharing with us. It'll be great to see uh, such a relationship with the New Zealand Planning Institute as well. Is there an existing relationship, formal or otherwise, between Na'aho and New Zealand Planning Institute? We don't, uh, we don't have a formal um, relationship with them yet. Largely when it's come to the planning space, we obviously we work with uh, Te Papa, um, Papa Pounamu, who are the um, Māori and Pacifica planners. We've worked with them more in a, um, in a collaborative manner when it's come to sort of different, doing different research projects. I guess it hasn't been formalised mainly because it's still, a lot of our practitioners actually sit in both space, so there wasn't necessarily need, need for um, you know, a MOU in the way that there might be with other um, entities and also you know that's an invitation too so Papa Ponama are holding that space we stand in relationship with Papa Ponama and we talk or whatever, whatever it is that they want to see happen in that space but um, yeah we also have some of their Papa Ponama sit at the whole exec table as well. Um, Jade I thought it was a lovely uh, way to express the importance of the treaty in terms of a role for everyone and a place uh, for everyone and one of the questions online is Kia ora, I'm an immigrant designer, teacher now living and working in Aotearoa, very passionate about life cycle and sustainability. I have found Māori an exceptional example of this. Is there any, is there a social group or organisation body I can be part of to continue these conversations about Māori having more representation in the built environment across social and commercial projects? Thank you. Sorry, there's a few bits. I'm just wondering what's the bit to answer. Well, I think very cool. Yeah, <laughs> I think, uh, I think uh, the uh, particular person who's asking the question here is looking for uh, opportunities to continue that connection and be part of um, that role for everyone, a place for everyone. Are there any ideas about how they can continue uh, that conversation and journey? Yeah, so you can sign up to um, Ngaho as a as a co-papa. Is that what we call it? Where we've got a, a membership class that is um, for those who are, are not necessarily Māori but support the Kaupapa. And so um, I would encourage you to go onto our website and I might just click back to Jez because I'm not quite sure if I'm missing anything about the process. You might need a, a nomination, but you can also come along to Ahoy. So I know that's a bit tricky with COVID at the moment, but um, the Pānui will all go up on the Ngāho website and be sent out widely, including through um, NZIA channels usually. And so you're able to register and come along to any of our Nga Ahu Hui um, chairs. Yep, <laughs> that's bang on. Okay. Um, I think there's also like, I mean, I'm not sure um, where the um, Manu Hedi was uh, talking about being a teacher. Most of the, the tertiary institutes obviously often have like a, a Māori rōpū that's supporting their students coming through. So that can be a good place to touch base with people too. Excellent. Uh, there's another question here, and I'm not sure uh, if either of you are uh, across the answer, but I will put it out anyway. Is there any analysis of what happened in the years that were best for enrolment numbers for Māori students in architecture? I think it was on that slide, Jade, that you shared. Mm. Um, so the answer is I don't know, but um, there is a full report that was produced from that study. So there may be some information because I, I don't know if they just looked at data or if they also potentially did interviews. In either case, it will have the names of those co-authors. And so I would suggest finding the report. Um, I'm so sorry, I don't have the link handy. Um, and then potentially contacting those who were involved and they'll be able to let you know if that exists. Um, for those that are members of the Institute, um, that particular report by Errol Hahoff and Paolo Baron from Auckland University um, was the subject of a webinar 
and the link is up on the NZIA resources website. So uh, if you're keen to track that down, those two authors might be able to um, assist you with that particular question. I also see Kura uh, Lucy uh, is online and asking a question around uh, partnership approaches with Māori practitioners and the Institute for Auckland's Urban Design Panel. Um, I would say in that respect that uh, the Institute was asked recently for nominations for that panel and there was a cross-section um, of people put forward um, in terms of nominations um, for that panel. Uh, so I think we, we have tried um, to ensure that there is greater representation and voice um, in that area in terms of those nominations uh, to Auckland's panel. Uh, just scroll. They've also got um, uh, was actually the, on the governance um, board as well for the Auckland Urban Design Panel, which has um, changed in the last couple of years. So we've got a couple of seats at that table. I think this year we've actually increased the um, Tonga Te Whenua representation too, um, and there'll be a new uh, chair. One of the chairs is also um, Tonga Te Whenua. So yeah, we're slowly creating a bit of change in that. Um, we have. Um, put into the terms of reference, uh, um, more relational things like the um, connecting with mana whenua and connecting with te aranga principles too. So it's definitely a space that we're, um, that we're growing at the moment. Um, we are almost close to time, but I would uh, like to uh, recognise your efforts and generosity uh, this afternoon, uh, both Jade and Desna. I think you've highlighted the importance I suppose of what uh, often are spoken about in terms of the three P's in terms of participation, protection and partnership. And there is much more uh, to happen in this space. And I wondered whether each of you would like to share a final thought uh, with our audience today. Thank you so much. This has been um, a really fantastic uh, dialogue. Thank you for making space for us um, to share. Uh, I hope that those who have um, tuned in have found this um, thought provoking and hopefully they've have something to take away when they go back to work and back to their professional lives um, and even into their personal lives. So, kia ora uh, Desna, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave with our audience today? Yeah, I think, you know, um, reflecting back on the concept of core UB, so where do your bones lie? Um, any of the, um, I know that we're speaking within the professional space at the moment, but I think one of the things that fundamentally changes the way that you go about doing your work and I've noticed this with our hui over the years when we've been working with people from different cultures is really thinking about yourself and where you come from and what it is that drives your mahi um, and how do you connect with place that any of these the forums that you're operating with within that you should come to these as your whole self so um, it's a way of being it's a way of doing and, and that it is personal um, and that it's relational and um, a lot of that change actually it happens on a person-to-person -person basis we're, we're setting as many examples as we can within the professional fields and, and um, having uh, you know discussions about obviously education pathways and we have uh, discussions about leaders within local council and within central government etc cetera, etc cetera. but what it comes down to on a day-to-day -day basis is everybody that's involved in this conversation actually takes a personal position and a personal commitment to living in relationship to these values and to really thinking about your connection our personal connections with place so um, I think it's worthwhile considering that um, as you go forward in your mahi that you always go forward as yourself and as, your, as a representation of your ancestors and your kids that are going to uh, follow along these pathways after you. So, um, yeah, to be present in these conversations as yourself. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, that's a wonderful way uh, to end today's webinar. And once again, thank you uh, both for your uh, contributions and continued work. Um, in this space and I look forward to the continuing kōrero uh, with you both on this important topic. Um, so good afternoon and um, have a good day. Ka kite anō.